Good morning, everyone. We are reading in book two, Book of the Traveler of the World, and we are following King Aswapati in his um, exploration of all the many planes of universal existence that make up the world stare. In the first canto of this book, uh, he is given a glimpse of that whole stare of worlds mounting from the inconscient matter of our base all the way up to the pure existence, the borderline to the transcendent. And he has started climb up that stair of world. First of all, to the plane of subtle matter, which is the one closest to our own, most like this material world that we live in, the one that gives kind of templates uh, for what is manifested here. And then he has started exploring the worlds of life. Sri Aurobindo devotes six cantos cantos three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, to the worlds of life. And at the moment, we are reading in Canto six, kingdoms and godheads of the greater life. We have seen how the life force descended into matter and became imprisoned there and has had to slowly evolve upwards, first in very, very simple living forms, then in more complex ones. He has shown us um, the godheads, the little spiritual entities behind the veil who are influencing our lives, especially the level of the little life where love and light and largeness lack. There's these little entities doing all kinds of mischief, making disturbances. But now he has moved on to the realm of greater life, the goddess of the greater life, the great creative force, forever producing new marvels, wonderful things, and um, influencing us in our creativity, our creative movements. But he's finding it very puzzling, and for us also, it has been difficult to understand all these many aspects. We have reached page 189, and Sri Aurobindo describes him on line 578. He describes King Aswapati as a wanderer, straying amid fugitive scenes. He lost its signs and chased each failing guess. He's trying to understand the clues of life but it's very difficult. Ever he met key words, ignorant of their key, a sun that dazzled its own eye of sight, a luminous enigma's brilliant hood lit the dense purple barrier of thought's sky, a dim large trance showed to the night her star. That's where we stopped reading last time. So we'll read on from there. Fanny, would you begin? This sitting near an open window there, he read by lightning flash or crowding flash, chapters of the metaphysical romance of the soul's search for lost behind and the fictions drawn from spirits her caprices and fancies and meaning to love, her rash, unseasonable sleep as in crystallized curves, the magnificent wrappings of her secrecy that hold her to the universe out of sight. Her insignificant forms woven on her robe, a meaningful outline of the soul that seems through her false transparency of thought union, her rich brocade with imaged fancy soul and mutable masks and embroidered in the sky. Mm, thank you. This he is King Aswapati, 
and at the moment this experience that he's having trying to understand the mysteries of life. So Sri Aurobindo uh, gives us this image of King Aswapati sitting near an open window and through that window he's getting flashes of lightning, not a clear constant light. He's reading by lightning flash on crowding flash chapters of her metaphysical romance. There's two interesting words here. A romance, uh, it makes us think of the medieval literature of uh, stories of adventures, of uh, wandering knights and of having to fight demons and having many adventures on the way. Aswapati is experiencing some kind of series of adventures like that. But it's also a metaphysical romance. This adjective describes a certain school of poets from the 17th century in England who used very, very complex and surprising imagery to try and convey um, deeper thoughts and experiences. So it's something like that, that he's uh, some literature which is um, involved, complex, and difficult to understand. Life is like that. Hmm? Her Sorry? Her. her means her, the goddess of greater life, yes, the creative life force. Yeah. So this romance is telling about the soul's search for lost reality. That is what Aswapati is actually doing. You know? But it's also uh, describing her fictions, stories. But these stories are based on, drawn from authentic fact of spirit. But then there are also pure fancies, her caprices and conceits, very complicated ideas and suggestions and her meanings locked. Suggestions are there which can't be understood. Her rash, unseasonable freaks. Freak is something abnormal and strange. Her mysteried turns. He saw the magnificent wrappings of her secrecy. She disguises herself, folding her desirable body out of sight. Life, the secret of life, hides itself from us. On that robe, that wonderful robe she disguises herself in, there are um, embroideries, the strange, significant forms woven on her robe. He saw her meaningful outlines of the souls of things. Those are meaningful, significant things. But he also saw her false transparencies of thought hue, just the opposite. Her rich brocades, very precious, wonderful fabrics, embroidered with imaged fancies and mutable masks, masks that change, broideries of disguise. Life is beautiful, attractive, baffling. Varadarajan. <laughs> Can you s uh, read a little stronger? A thousand babbling faces of the truth look at you from the form of the unknown eye and worldless hopes and recognizable hope from the figures of the masquerade, masquerade or tears from the second type of magnificence and subtle splendor of the pleasure. In sudden titillations of the unknown, inexpressive sound, became radical, ideas that seemed unbeing, flashed of truth, voices that came from unseen, raging worlds, uttered the syllables of the unmanifest, who closed the body of the mystic world, and the diagrams of the upper cloud, sealed and unreadable columns, or used, or used a few and figures to reconstitute the general element of time. Thank you. Anybody would like to ask anything about these lines? Sorry? Recondite. It's like occult, 
hidden, difficult to find and understand. Sorry? Yes, he says a thousand, vaguely, an uncountable number. Yeah. And the inexpressive sounds became theoretical? Yeah, inexpressive sounds. It might be a sound that seems to have no meaning or significance. Suddenly, in some flash from the unknown, he sees that it's telling some truth, veridical. It means truth speaking, revealing some truth. Inexpressive sounds suddenly became veridical. And similarly, ideas that seemed uh, unmeaning flashed out truth. Voices that came from unseen, waiting worlds, worlds that haven't manifested yet, uttered the syllables of the unmanifest. Voices, or at least sounds, come, and these syllables clothe the body of the mystic word, the word of creation. And then there are these wizard diagrams, magical uh, figures expressing the occult law, the hidden law. They seal up some precise, unreadable harmony or used hue, color, and figure shapes to reconstitute the herald blazon of time's secret things. This refers to the art of heraldry, which they had in ancient India. We read in Mahabharata how each of the, the warriors in the Great War, they had their flag with their symbol on it. Heraldry is that uh, it's connected with the heralds. You know, Each hero has his herald who goes in front of him and tells he's coming who he is. And uh, in Europe, uh, in the Middle Ages, this art became very highly developed. And to this day, there's a college of heralds in London, so that when any child is born into a, a noble family, the heralds can immediately work out uh, what is the, the sign, the coat of arms, and the, the blazon of each of these um, people. <laughs> and, uh, it, there are symbols. We can see these shields with symbols that tell somehow the history of the family that that person belongs to. So it's something like that. There's, uh, he's seeing signs like that that tell about the secret things of time, uh, announcing and explaining some of these secret things of time. Franz, you had read? Yes. The mystic word. So we'll find this appearing very often in the poem. In a way, Savitri herself is the word. She represents that commanding word which has brought the creation into existence. It's the word which expresses the divine idea and that has given rise to all this manifestation. Uh, Franz. In her green lurking depths, her secrets of joy, her danger clasped delight. He glimpsed the hidden wings of her socket hopes, a glimmer of blue and gold and scarlet fire in her covered lanes, bordering her charmed spirit paths. By her singing rivulets, calm lakes, he found to grow for golden fruits and bliss and the beauty of her flowers dream. Mm. So all this is landscape imagery, no? Shobindo makes us see a kind of landscape of life, her green wildernesses and lurking depths here within, within the, the forests. There are places, uh, secret places we can't see, and there are thickets. Thickets is the undergrowth in a forest. There's bushes and shorter plants. It's difficult to make your way through the thickets and there may be danger lurking there, as well as delightful discoveries. So in those landscapes, he glimpses the hidden wings of her songster hopes. Songster, it's a bird. Hmm? So he's saying, hidden in those thickets, appearing here and there, he sees like beautiful colored birds. Um, 
And here's the song of the hopes which life gives, the promises. No? comes in a form of glimmer, a, sh a, sh a shining glimpse of blue and gold and scarlet fire. <coughs> Those are forests. And in her covert lanes, secret little byways, bordering her chance field paths and by her singing rivulets and calm lakes. It's a more peaceful kind of a pastoral landscape. He found the glow of her golden fruits of bliss, as if there are orchards where he can see these lovely fruits growing, no? and the beauty of her flowers of dream and muse. It's one of the miraculous things that Sri Aurobindo does in this poem, is by um, giving us imagery that suggests things that we can recognize, that we're familiar with. He can help us somehow to get some glimpse, some idea of secret things, hidden mysteries. Marianne, would you read? I think, I think you'll have to speak a little louder too. Mm -hmm. And if the meaning of the world of God's change by glory, he watched in the infinite radiance of the, of the suns, the twin sun of birth of one circle of flowers, and the three of sacrifice of spiritual love. In the sleepy splendor of the moons, he saw a perpetual repetition through the hours. Thoughts dance, dragonfly on mystery stream that seem but never taste the stillness grace, and heard the laughter of the world's desires running as if to escape from long kept for hands, singing sweet and great bells of fantasy amidst um, the light symbol. Let's pause, pause there, Marianne. Hmm? So it's the same kind of thing, yeah. giving imagery of things that we might see in a beautiful, unusual countryside. But Sri Aurobindo says it's as if a miracle of the heart's change by joy. One sees or experiences something and it changes everything for you. Aswapati watched the alchemist radiance of her sons. Alchemy is the science of turning ordinary substances into gold. So that's what the sun, these sons of life do. They turn everything golden. And what he sees is the crimson outburst of one secular flower on the tree of sacrifice of spiritual love. This line suggests to us what mother, the, the significance that she has given to the pomegranate flower. And she tells a lovely story that uh, this flower, uh, which grows in the, the dry countries of the Middle East, uh, there's a legend associated with it about uh, an avatar, savior, rejected by the world hunted and wounded by his enemies. He's looking for somewhere uh, where he can leave his body in peace. And he goes out into the, he flees out into the desert. And there a pomegranate bush springs up and he's able to take uh, refuge beneath it. And uh, that is why the, the pomegranate flower has this intense, uh, wonderful color. I, mother doesn't give a name. She says long, long ago. It's, I don't think this story is associated with Krishna. It's a story from the Middle East, perhaps from the Chaldean knowledge. And uh, so she says this is the tree of sacrifice, of spiritual love. And here he's saying that in life, life even as we know it, um, on this tree of sacrifice, of spiritual love, one secular flower may grow. One flower that is not uh, spiritual, which speaks of the heart's love. Mm? Interesting. He says that can happen too. 
and in the next sentence, uh, it's like a memory. Of course, we know that Schrobindo, when he was in England, he used to, uh, to love to go walking in the countryside. This is almost an image from that. In the sleepy splendor of her noons, the hottest time of day in the summer, maybe you can wander uh, beside a river, he mentions that in other rivulets, and see the dragonflies as if dancing above the surface of the water. They are, they are big and they have brilliant colors. But he says this is thoughts dance of dragonflies on mystery stream. And when the, dra da the dragonflies uh, da fly above the surface of the water, they seem to skim it, just touch it, but never test. They don't uh, try to see how strong <laughs> is that uh, the current of that water, its murmurs race. But then it's as if he's in India and he's hearing the laughter of the rose desires of life, that is, desires of the heart, embodied as beautiful girls, as apsaras, running as if to escape from longed-for hands, jingling sweet anklet bells of fantasy. Sometimes in an Indian forest, we can imagine something like that, that there are uh, apsaras calling to each other amongst the trees and the hills, and uh, we can almost hear their anklet bells. Mm. Or again, you would read. Mm. In its life symbols of her occult powers, he moved and held them as close real forms. In that life more concrete than the lives of men, dropped heartbeats of the hidden reality. And what it was there, what he, uh, what he but think and feel, self framed what here takes out of world shapes. A comrade of silence on her austere heights, accepted by her mighty loneliness. He stood with her in unmitigating deeps, where life and being are the sacrament, offered to the reality beyond, and saw her lose into infinity. Her hooded eagles of significance, messengers of thought to the unknown. Thank you. He's in the realm of greater life, which also influences and contacts our own. But he's really there in that realm where everything is much more intense than we can experience it here. So he's moving amidst these living symbols of life's occult power. He feels them as close, real forms. That life is more concrete, more intensely real than the lives of men. And it, within it is throbbing heartbeats of the hidden reality. Everything that we only think and feel as if at one remove is there embodied as a, a living form. What here takes outward shapes that are borrowed from those inner worlds, there they are self-framed. They have their own self-existence. They don't depend on our perceptions. So another experience that he has is as if rising high up into the mountain, a comrade of silence on the austere peaks of life, the Himalayan peaks, accepted by her mighty loneliness. He stood with her, with the spirit of life, on meditating peaks where life and being are a sacrament offered to the reality beyond, a sacred offering, a sacred communion on those highest levels of life. Life and being, life and existence are a sacred communion offered to that highest reality beyond. And there he sees her loosing into infinity, her hooded eagles of significance. Uh, in Kazakhstan, there are people who go hunting with eagles. The young men, uh, when they're in their teens, they have to go out and find an eagle's nest and uh, take one or two of the young 
and bring them up and train them and then when they, the chicks are adult, they go hunting with them. So it's an image like that. He's got uh, an eagle or eagles with him and he lets them loose to go hunting. Hmm? The, the, the eagles wear a hood. It's only when he takes off, the hunter takes off the hood that the bird can fly freely. So that's what he sees life doing unhooding these eagles of significance, of deep meaning, and setting them free. Mm -hmm. Setting them free as messengers, messengers of thought flying up to the unknowable. Wonderful images, no? one picture after another. Ranko, uh, uh, Narayan. Hmm? Identified in soul vision and soul sense, entering into her depths as into a heart. All he became that she was and longed to be. Talk with her and journey with her step. Be with her breath and stand all with her eyes. That's so he might learn the secret of her soul. A weakness overmastered by his sea, he admired her splendid front of pomp and play and the marvels of her rich and delicate craft and thrilled to the insistence of her craft. In person, he bore to the sorceries of her might, felt lay in her abrupt, mysterious way, her hands that meet pain in, her, in their violent grasp, her touch that moves, her powers that see and drive. Thank you. So he identifies with the spirit of life, the goddess of life identified with her in soul vision and soul sense through sight and through feeling he can enter into the depths of life as into a house he becomes identifies with all that she was or wants to be he thought with her thoughts journeyed with her steps lived with her breath, her life energy, and scanned all with her eyes, seeing it as she sees it. He identifies with her like that so that he can learn the secret of her soul. So when he does that, he becomes like a witness, overmastered by his scene, thoroughly absorbed, as we may be when we're watching some very interesting, beautiful or thrilling film. We forget all about ourselves and our lives. We are overmastered by what we are seeing. So he admired her splendid front, this outer appearance that she puts on of pomp, of splendor, of play, the marvels of her rich and delicate craft. She's so skillful and thrilled to the insistence of her cry. Life's cry is very insistent and overmasters us. No? In passion, he bore the sorceries, all her enchantments, the sorceries of her might. He feels her will laid on him. He has to obey it. Her hands that need fate, this kneading. It's what we, a baker does with bread. He works and works and works with his hands in order to bring it alive and shape it properly. Mm -hmm. He feels her touch that moves, all her different powers that get hold of us and drive us. He feels all that through identity. Paula. But this too he saw, her soul that wept within, her seekings vain that clutch at fleeting truth, her hopes whose somber gaze makes with despair, the passion that possessed her longing limbs, the trouble and rapture of her yearning breasts, her mind that toils unsatisfied with its fruits, her heart that captures not the one beloved. Always he met a veiled and seeking force, an exiled goddess building mimic heavens, a sphinx whose eyes look up to a hidden sun. Thank you. Yes. Even in greater life, hmm. life doesn't look that great. It, there's still this dissatisfaction. Yes. The 
dissatisfaction of life. If we go right back to Canto 3 and its first section, it's, uh, Canto 3 is the glory and the fall of life. And it, um, on page 118, he describes uh, the life that he first experiences when he moves into the life world like this, no? um, page, uh, on page 118, line 75. Oh, sorry, page 118, uh, uh, we can, I'll read from line 70. Amid her swift, untold variety, something remained dissatisfied, ever the same, and in the new saw only a face of the old, for every hour repeated all the rest, and every change prolonged the same unease. A spirit of herself and aim unsure, tired soon of too much joy and happiness. She needs the spur of pleasure and of pain and the native taste of suffering and unrest. She strains for an end that never can she win. Perverse savor haunts her thirsting lips. For the grief she weeps, which came from her own choice. For the pleasure yearns that racked with wounds her breast. Aspiring to heaven, she turns her steps towards hell. Chance she has chosen and danger for playfellows. Fate's dreadful swing she has taken for cradle and seat. This is how Asvapati first <coughs> perceives life. And now he's passed through the little life and the greater life. It's a similar picture. He's still seeing it. But then the last lines of this first section, Shobindo tells us something else. He says, yet pure and bright from the timeless was her birth. A lost world rapture lingers in her eyes. Her moods are faces of the infinite. Beauty and happiness are her native right, and endless bliss her eternal home. So in the rest of the canto, Sri Aurobindo gives us a glimpse of those realms of endless bliss. But the greater life that he's seeing now in this higher realm, there's still this dissatisfaction, certain lostness. And that's exactly what uh, Asvapati wants to find the solution to all that. Why has he set off on this journey? Yeah. He's looking for the power that can make life on earth a divine life and solve all these contradictions. He doesn't find it in the king of kingdom of subtle matter, and he's not finding it so far in the realms of life. At the end of Canto 8, he does find something which is a kind of solution for him, a personal realization. But he still has to go on searching all through the rest of Book 2, all its 15 cantos, and then the four cantos of Book 3, until he really uh, encounters the Supreme Divine Mother and knows that he has to bring down her power into the world to save earth and men. And uh, that's what he begs her for. And that's the boon that she grants to him in, in Canto 4 of Book 3. She says, yes, uh, one shall be born who embodies her own power. And that will be the birth of Savitri. So in the first part of the poem, we have this quest of King Asvapati, and he's not able to fulfill his quest. He only gets this promise from the Supreme Mother. But in the second part of the book, Savitri fulfills his aspiration. She's able finally to win the consent of the Supreme and his wonderful prophecy of how everything will change and the earthly life will become the life divine. But for the time being, here we are with life as a sphinx. The sphinx is the one who poses us the really existential question, the questions that we have to answer in order to be able to continue our journey. In the, in the legend, it's like that. The traveler is traveling, and uh, there 
On his way, he encounters this sphinx. She looks something like a bird and something like a lion and something like a woman. And uh, she asks que a question. And if you can't answer that question, she destroys you. But if you can answer the question, then you can master her and you can continue with your journey. So in the tradition, in the traditional legend, there are two different uh, questions mentioned and two different answers. The most well-known question is uh, that she asks, who is that creature who walks on four legs in the morning, and two legs in the noonday, and three legs at night or in the evening? Who knows the answer? Human hmm? being. The human being, yeah. yes. That's a child on yeah. four legs, yeah. uh, in the youth, on two legs, and with a stick. Yeah, really. So the answer to the riddle of life is man. We have to think about this. This is a message that Sri Aurobindo is giving us through the, throughout the poem. That you, you human beings, you're here, you're very special. You have a special responsibility. You're the answer to the riddle of life. That's one of the answers. The other question is about two sisters. Who are those two sisters? each of whom gives birth to the other. Day and night. Every day gives birth to a night, and every night gives birth to a day. So that is the answer of duality, you know, that these two are complementary, and every we can always remember that however dark the night, it's going to give birth to a day, a glorious day. Yes? Some inner experience when I came to Savitri Mama, 2005-06. My life changed totally. It's a great lot when I started before I came in aspiration, and now I come uh, totally, 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 uh, all the time. I love this marvel. So this greater life, he shows that the higher levels of greater life, they almost touch the secret. But the place <laughs> the presence, the absence of presence. Yeah. A lot of people come in this and modern, they tell me you have some special presence. So that's a great blessing that Mother and Sri Aurobindo have you, given yeah. us. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. But that's what I interesting that he says, you know, the highest levels of life, they're almost touching the Supreme, but not quite. And that's why uh, in the next cantos we'll see uh, Asvapati has to leave <laughs> this greater life and go down right into the roots of the mystery. That's what we shall read in the next cantos. Anyway, uh, we've still not reached the end of this canto. Two more sections to read, and the last one's quite long. Um, Patricia, would you read?
Thank you. Anybody would like to share anything? Yes, it's, it's a very subtle, suggestive line. Life promises us things, but it doesn't seem to deliver its promises often. And that's because it's promising us something from another level which it can't provide. Life has fallen from its griefless state. So what it offers to us is that the, the pathos, the, in, the intense feeling of that loss. The feeling is not the pathos. Hmm? The feeling is something else. Sorry? The feeling is not the pathos. It's no, it's, the, the, it's that pathos. It's that feeling that here is something <coughs> intense, some, some deep feeling. This is promise that life gives us, but she's not able to fulfill that promise. There was a time uh, about 200 years ago when many thinking people came to the conclusion that uh, religion could not be satisfying. They couldn't be satisfied with religion. And uh, many of them uh, turned to art in all its forms, looking for the satisfaction of this promise. And even today, if we think about the greater life, the representatives of the greater life, the creative people who give us uh, wonderful uh, music and poetry and even uh, uh, beautiful dramatic performances, are the heights of art. It, it somehow promises something higher, but it doesn't deliver on its promise. It's not able to do that quite, unless we can perceive this spirit, the spirit within. This is the only real thing in all apparent thing, and that's true even here, even upon earth. The spirit is life's key. Elsewhere, he says, our lives are a paradox with God for key, and it's difficult to solve the riddle of our life because the key is hidden. It's beneath the surface in the subliminal somewhere. We don't find the presence of that spirit. So that is the solution that King Aswapati finds in, uh, in Canto A. He suddenly becomes aware of the divine presence in and intention in everything. It becomes very, very intimately real for him. And then he's suddenly cast up into paradise. He doesn't have to go anywhere. He's suddenly there, but he doesn't stay there very long because there are other things to be discovered as well as the secret of life. Cryptic, the people who do crossword, expert people who do crop, uh, crosswords, they like to do cryptic crosswords, ones that are very difficult to solve. <laughs> a, a, a saying that is cryptic, actually this line which Naren has pointed out, it's a bit cryptic, no? A pathos of lost height is life's appeal. If, if uh, you like to explore this question further, um, th there's a chapter in one of Schrobindo's books. It's called The Supra-Rational Absolute of Life. I think it's in the human cycle, either the human cycle or the ideal of human unity, one of those two books. And to, to really get Schrobindo's view of life and the mystery of life and the value of life, that's a very, very helpful uh, chapter to read. I could say Sri Aurobindo's unique view of the value of life. But here he gives us a hint of it. It's the spirit within that gives it all its value. There was a quote recently on the Oxford board mm -hmm. of something Sri Aurobindo said about art. Yes. And what I recall of it is something like uh, he said that artists make a mistake in thinking that their art is the highest thing. Mm. But he says actually it's just one form of expression. Yes, it's a form so of action. I think that you have to find the reality, then the art is supposed to express that reality, then it will be perfect and sublime. If it's an attempt to get to the truth, mm. then it will always be substandard. Yeah, in, you remember we read in uh, book two, canto two, there it's, it's the truth that comes to the artist. Ah. Of course, the artist has to be receptive, but uh, the true creativity is a gift says uh, he's, he's the one who's given the patent of that particular gift on earth and he has to wait for the postman to bring it and then he has to be very careful how he unwraps the packet that he doesn't uh, uh, spoil that um, uh, wonderful gift that's given. The artist is just a transmitter. Yes, yes a channel. Yeah. Yeah. 
know, but uh, not everybody can be a channel like that. So the, the people who are able to be receptive, they, they have special gifts. And it's not only the inspiration, there has to be the perfect execution. Well, that's another side of it. If we, <laughs> if we see mother sketches and Huta's paintings, we can see the difference of the pure inspiration and then the artist struggling to give expression to it. That's where we can find such charm in children's art. It's uh, spo so spontaneous, yes. But there's something behind it. Yes, uh, the spirit behind, yes. I'm sorry, dear, can't hear you. Yes. 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 Yes, that's how it is. Yes, thank you.